Okay, welcome to, um, to today's presentation on the F-14 systems. Um, the Tomcat is a, a complex aircraft, but it's a pretty hands-off uh, when operating the various systems because it has a lot of automation in it. So you, by just flying the aircraft, you might not get behind what's actually working in the background. It also has a lot of redundancy, which is also um, automated to a large extent, but there's some things you need to know in case things fail, which I'm also going to cover today. So what we're going to look at today is uh, the engines, basic arrangement, and uh, a few things uh, about the accessories and what they do. The ECS, the Environmental Control System, which uh, provides cooling air for the cockpit and various other systems. The fuel system, of course. The hydraulic system, which powers our flight controls and uh, other utility and the electrical system, which provides uh, electrical power for a lot of electronics that we have on the top. Yeah. So let's start with the engines. Um, this is going to be a schematic depiction. So basically, we, we cut our engine in half, and then we look at the side, uh, from the side on it. right? And we're going to look at the upper half because this is uh, symmetric, right? So does this make sense? So OK, let's just start. Uh, this is the, 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 the the schematic depiction of the core engine. It has a nine stage high pressure compressor or HPC. It looks uh, like this in reality. This is basically nine rotors which spin that way. They compress air and feed it downwards. Uh, this all sits on a shaft which is the, the dark gray line here and on the same shaft we have a single stage high pressure turbine and the turbine basically delivers the, the torque to, to run the compressor. Here you can see the turbine. This is actually the, another turbine, not, not the one we have here, but uh, they look very similar. And between these two, we have the combustion chamber. So basically, we have the, the principle of any jet engine, suck, squeeze, bang, blow. That's basically the, the dead joke of air engines. If we do first, we, the compressor sucks air and then it compresses that air. That compressed air is delivered to the combust combustion chamber where a continuous flame is burning um, and producing energy. And then the hot energy rich gases exit the combustion chamber and go through the turbine. And the turbine basically takes out the, the energy of the, of the hot gases and transforms them into mechanical energy to drive our high pressure compressor. So this is the so-called core engine. Basically, uh, the F-110, it's a Tompkins engine, is a, is a after burning turbo fan. So we basically, we have a core engine and we have an outer bypass engine. And this is this part. So before air enters the compressor, at the very front, we have a free stage fan slash low pressure power compressor. It sits on its own shaft, which is not mechanically linked to this shaft. It's independent, but it is mechanically linked to the free stage low pressure turbine. This is what you see here. This is how it looks. Um, so basically uh, the same principle um, when, when the, the hot gases pass through the HPT, they still have a good deal of energy left and that energy is used by the LPT to provide the torque necessary to drive our free stage fan and LPC. So why do we have that? Basically, um, I mean, if you saw some civilian airliners, you see that they have that, that big ass fan in the front. And in these aircraft, basically the, the thrust that the engines produce comes from that fan. That the core engine is only there to drive the fan. But uh, in the fighter aircraft, we, we can't make these engines so big. So uh, we have to find a bit of a compromise. So we have a smaller diameter free stage fan, but uh, still um, this is, this part here produces a large portion of our thrust and it also has another big advantage, which I'm going to come to in a second. And since we're a cool fighter guys, of course, we have the after burning chamber in the back. So basically we can, there are spray bars here, just pick them. Uh, we have spray bars here that inject fuel into the after burning chamber, ignite it and give us an extra bang. Now, one thing about um, afterburning turbofan engines, they have a big um, advantage over old turbojet engines with afterburner, like in the Phantom. So you see, if we didn't have that part, right, only the core engine, 
the, the, the air that exits here, it's not going to be too energy rich because it already had combusted a lot of energy here. So there's not much oxygen left for the afterburning chamber. But in the turbofan, we have a lot of air that goes through the bypass duct, which has not seen any combustion. So basically what this fan does also is it, it shoves a lot of oxygen rich air into the afterburning chamber. And this is what makes this engine and other uh, turbo afterburning turbofan engines so much so powerful because they deliver a lot more air to the afterburning chamber than a traditional jet engines can do. So this is uh, basically um, the schematic arrangement. We have uh, two fuel pumps. One is the regulator pump in the afterburning chamber. It uh, regulates the amount of fuel uh, to the combustion chamber, which basically controls the power. And here's the, the spray bars for the afterburner. So let's see at the indications that we have in the Tomcat. Basically, we have the engine instrument group. And on the very left, we have the RPM. So this is basically the RPM for our core engine. Not for the, for, the, for the fan, but for the core, because this is the more critical value. The, the HPC and the HPG, they spin at a, at a higher um, RPM than the LPC. So we want to monitor, monitor that, and not exceed the RPM. And the limit is 107%, which is denoted by that little, little line here. And this is basically our limit on the engine RPM. And of course, the RPM correlates with more thrust. Next one is the exhaust gas temperature. It measures the exhaust gas just behind the LPG. Now, why is that important? The turbine blades, they are under a lot of thermal and physical stress. They are bent, twisted, stretched, whatever, by the aerodynamical forces. And also the gases entering here are very hot, like 1,300 degrees and so. So if, if this part gets too hot, the HPT blades, they start to, their stiffness starts to drop. So they start deforming and in the worst case, they will disintegrate. So we want to prevent that. And this is why we have to monitor our EGT. Now it was found that the EGT here correlates strongly with the turbine, so-called turbine inlet, <laughs> turbine inlet temperature. So we actually do not need to measure the temperature here. This is what the TF30s do. They have the TIT, they measure directly here. But this is not really necessary. We can do that here and uh, define a limit, which is uh, 935 degrees of Celsius. This is something that can be exceeded for a couple of seconds. And we have an even harder limit of about 970, which must not be exceeded. So if we, if we reach that point, um, we risk uh, a catastrophic engine failure. And the last part is the fuel flow. It monitors the fuel flow to the combustion chamber, not to the afterburner spray bar. So this is only a core engine fuel flow. Keep that in mind. And this is uh, also useful because we can use it for flight performance calculations. Um, and also, this also correlates strongly with thrust. So for example, I like to use the fuel flow as a, to set my power. I know when, when doing a case one departure and I want to fly 300 knots, I know that about 4,000 pounds per minute will do. Also, uh, in the stack, I know about 2,500 will give me best uh, economy. You can do that, of course, in the RPM, but uh, I, I personally find the fuel flow more useful for that. So this is basically uh, the engine, how it works. Again, air is getting sucked in here. Part of it is used as thrust. Another part goes down the high pressure compressor, gets combusted, drives the HPT, the high pressure turbine, uh, sorry, the high power turbine, high pressure, sorry, pressure, it's high pressure turbine. And what is left is um, we used to drive the low pressure turbine, which itself drives our fan at the front. And then we have the afterburning chamber, which is used for uh, to create our afterburning flame. Here's a little more naturalistic the depiction of our F110 engine. Here you can see the three fan LPT stages. Here we got the one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine um, compressor stages and the single stage LPT. And I don't know why we only see two ones. I have this from an F-16 side, so maybe their engine is a bit different, but there should be three of these. Also in the front of you, we have the so-called inlet guide vanes. Uh, this is when people complain that on the Heeper F-14, the, the fan is not animated. Well, what you see at the front is the inlet guide vanes. They don't turn, so this is correct. And here we have our, our very large um, afterburning chamber. 
and at the end we have our exhaust nozzle which we're gonna come to later any questions so far great where we can find the combustor chamber uh the, the, this is here this is the circle basically between between the lpt and the hpc this is basically it's you can barely see it but this is a little bit this is the free space and the, the, the nozzles they are arranged in a circular way there's also igniter plugs and yeah this is where the where the burning takes place and you can see that it's basically right in front of the turbine so the temperature here is going to be very high and this is the, the critical part uh, uh, temperature wise so this is our engine but we also have a few accessories to our engine which help us make it more efficient so these are the left and right air inland control system or ramps this is basically the large ramps that you see when looking in front of the aircraft and at the back we have the nozzles the left and right nozzles they're so-called convergent divergent nozzles we're going to come to that a little bit later but let's take a look ah sorry and then of course we have the engine control now the f-110 has an electronic engine control unit which is called the augmenter fan temperature control this is basically a fancy name for FADIC or full digital engine control and what it does it it basically controls the amount of fuel that comes into the combustion chamber based on power setting temperature speed and whatnot a lot of stuff it also has a manual backup mode we're going to come to that later and then our engine of course provides the mechanical energy to drive the left and right generators the combined and flight hydraulic pumps and the left and right fuel pumps Okay, let's take a look at the AICS. This is a cross-section view of our inlet. The engine is somewhere here. And this is the situation when you're flying subsonic. Air just goes straight down the intake, gets sucked in. A part of it is, 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 is getting bypassed. I don't know why exactly, but the engineers thought this is a good idea. And for the, for the subsonic flight, we don't need actually ramps at all. You can see they're fully stowed. But we're needed in transonic. And why is that? Well, aero engines, they do not like supersonic air, like at all. If supersonic air enters the engine, the engine is gonna it's gonna stall. So basically the, the compressor pressure ratio drops and uh, the flame uh, the, the burner pressure drops, the, the turbine cannot provide that much power. So basically this is a self-reinforcing process and eventually the engine will just die. So we have to make sure that whatever airspeed we're flying. That the air that enters the engine has subsonic speed and this is what the ramps are for and to do that they exploit a physical phenomenon so whenever we have supersonic flow right let's just imagine this is supersonic and if that flow gets deflected by something like a ramp a so-called shock occurs and that shock is basically a very i can just go to the next slide here we can see it um, this is the transonic um, state where we are not flying supersonic yet, but we can get local supersonic air because we have a bit of, of flow constriction here and the engine, it sucks air, it accelerates air. So right about here, we're getting supersonic air. Now what happens is if that supersonic air is getting deflected by just a couple of degrees, I mean, you can't really see it, but the ram should go down something like this. So basically the flow is deflected and when that happens a shock occurs a so-called supersonic shock and this is just a, a tiny narrow band and over this band the flow rapidly accelerates um, from either a supersonic to subsonic which is called a strong shock or from supersonic to a lower supersonic speed which is a, a weak shock and uh, concurrently with that uh, the pressure rises so this is our transonic um, state you can see the ramps they have been deflected a little bit downward just enough to create one shock to slow the air down to subsonic speed again and let's look at the supersonic uh, situation now what we have here we have supersonic air coming from here and you can see the the, the, the lip in the front already has a small angle and this already creates so-called bleak shock it has a certain angle and that angle will be dependent on on the ramp angle and the airspeed so this first shock already um, slows our air down a bit but not quite to subsonic speed so we keep going downwards and we always have the second deflection of flow which causes our second shock 
uh, decelerating the flow even further. And this goes on. We have our third deflection. And I'm not quite sure where this shock comes from, but I suspect that the ramp has a little bit of a, it changes its direction a little bit. Now, the question is, why do we need four shocks? Why don't we just use one big shock? Theoretically, that would be possible, but every shock comes at with a certain energy loss. Because remember, that air, it has a lot of kinetic energy. It's moving at a very fast speed, and we can use that speed for our engine, and we want to use that speed for our engine. But um, as the shock gets stronger, me meaning as it slows the air down more, there is more energy loss occurring with that. So ideally, we would have an infinite number of infinitely weak shocks that would provide a zero and we could convert all of the all of the kinetic energy into pressure energy. But this is technically not doable, so the engineers settled for this configuration. We have basically four moderate shocks which compress the air stage-wise and uh, minimize the energy loss. Now, one more thing why the EICS is such an important system. As I said, the angle of that shock depends on the deflection angle of the flow, which is basically the ramp angle, and the velocity. Now, our velocity changes, so if you want to focus all four shocks outside, and this is very critical, these four shocks, they must focus outside of the engine. If they don't, we're going to have a lot of aerodynamic problems. And to do that, the ramps have to be positioned precisely for every speed and every angle of attack configuration. This is also why each AICS controller has its own AOA pro on the left and right side of the um, below the cockpit. If you all have wondered what, what these probes, probes to the side of the, of the Tomcat are, two of them are the AICS AOA probes. And you need two of them because just imagine you're rolling, the left side is going down, the right side is going up. You're going to have different angle of attacks and thus different flow angles. And you have to reposition your ramps to match for that. This is basically uh, one one of the engineering tricks that engineers use to improve the Tomcat's efficiency. For example, the Hornets, they don't, they have a fixed ramp. It doesn't move, it just, it is at, at a fixed angle. It's not really a ramp, it's just a geometry. And it basically is a one size fits all solution, but it gets very inefficient at certain speeds. This is also one of the reasons why the Hornet can't get that fast. It just can't capitalize that much on, on the, the the compression then happens here because their inlet design is just not, not made for that. But of course, the upside is they don't have all this complicated stuff. And the Hornets, they don't need to go fast anyway because all they do is lame stuff like dropping bombs. So let's take a look at the engine nozzles and why we need these. Now, um, for uh, can I cut in for a second? Yes. Do you come to the uh, ramp controls also? What yes, are? of course. I'm gonna. This, okay. is, this is a bit of theory. I'm gonna. I'm gonna talk about the controls and emergencies and stuff. Copy. So, uh, let's talk about the nozzles real quick. Now, from aerodynamic theory, we know that the thrust of an engine is equals the mass flow times the difference in entry and exit velocity. Now, the mass flow uh, is. Is more or less fixed. It depends on our power setting. But what we can do is we can maximize the velocity the, at which our gases exit our engine. And how we do it is the so-called convergent-divergent flap. Here you can see it's, it's in two positions. The upper part is in the fully closed position. This is what you're going to get whenever you're um, above idle, up to mill. And this is the fully open position. This is what you get when you're at full afterburner. Now, basically, this solution here, this geometry fits um, all the power settings with all the non after burning power settings. Uh, what happens here? The air comes here into the um, convergent part, it accelerates, it's the, the, the effective flow cross section um, gets slower, and right here it reaches Mach 1. And as it reaches Mach 1, the loss of physics they, they get a bit um, reversed. So now, uh, a diffuser or a divergent geometry, it will not slow down the, the flow, it will accelerate it. This is what the divergent part is. So we accelerate here to Mach 1, and here it accelerates even further through the divergent uh, 
part. The diverge, uh, divergent part is very, very shallow. You can barely see it, but, but it's there. The, 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 the constriction, um, the divergent geometry is there. So, But as we activate our afterburner, we're getting a lot more pressure here. So to reach Mach 1 at that point, we're going to need a lot less constriction. And this is why the, the moving geometry is important. So for whatever afterburner setting, and the tier 30 is five distinct settings and the F110, it's basically um, an infinite amount. And based on the on the afterburning chamber pressure, uh, this divergent flap is gonna open. So it reduces the convergent part and increases the divergent part to accelerate the flow even further. And just a side note, uh, if you imagine these afterburner flames that you see, and they, if you look at them, they have kind of, of rings here or some rhombic structures. And this is a combination of, of shocks and expansion waves exiting the engine. They create that, that, um, that nice looking stuff. Okay, so this is the nozzles, and now let's talk about the controls. Um, we don't have much control for the AICS. We have uh, two switches which are on the uh, left knee panel. No, sorry, on the left side console. We can also either have them in auto, which means the AICS program will take care of positioning the ramps, or we can have them in stow. Stow means they're going to be driven to the fully uh, stowed position, basically, which is this. Um, next, we have our AFCT or engine control, we can also control that because we have a backup mode I was talking about. So we can either have them in PRI, which is the primary mode where the electronics take care of fuel control, or we can put it in SEC mode, which is secondary mode, where a, a hydromechanical backup is uh, is taking uh, is controlling the engine uh, combustion chamber fuel pump. And this has a bit of implications, which I'm going to talk about later. Let's take a look at the warning lights that we have in the cockpit that are associated with the engine. Let's start with the inlets. So left inlet, right inlet means there's some kind of fault in the AICS program. So basically the computer that controls the ramps has an error and cannot work anymore. Left and right ramps means that the ramps are out of commanded position. So basically the AICS commands a certain position and then the, the hydraulic actuators, they drive suit. And if they fail to do so, you're gonna get this error. These errors also often come in combination because if there's something wrong with the ICS programmer, you can guarantee that the ramps are also going to have some funky position. And the reaction to that is you put the ramps in stow because once your AICS fails, um, in worst case, it drives to the fully closed position and your engine goes out. You don't want that to happen, so you put them in stow and make sure you don't fly above Mach 1.2. Ideally, below Mach 1, but Mach 1.2 should be uh, still doable. Next thing is uh, oil temperature too hot. We don't have a temperature gauge, but we have these uh, warning lights. And if they come on, you throttle up to 85% to, to get the, the oil pump and the cooling system going a little more. But if these do not go out after a couple of minutes, uh, you have to turn off the engine. Left and right fuel pressure, as I mentioned earlier, each um, engine has this fuel boost pump. This is, this is not the pump that controls the combustion chamber full, but this is a pump that kind of pre um the Kansas is mounted behind uh, before the the controller pump so it basically already delivers some kind of pressure for the fuel control pump to to work with and this is important especially if you're in full mill or afterburner you going to you want that pump working so it delivers the amount of fuel and it can also fail and if this is the case uh, you want to be below 25000 feet and use as little power as necessary, basically cruise power. And also no afterburner. Well, this does not mean that afterburner will be unavailable. You can still select it, but chances are good that uh, the afterburner will go out because a single fuel pump uh, cannot take um, over the, the, cannot supply the demand of both engines. Next is oil pressure. Um, I think minimum oil pressure is uh, 25 PSI. We have, you have gauges for that on the left knee panel. This basically lights up when any of the uh, engines is below that value. And if this happens, you have to turn the engine off. You cannot run the engine uh, without oil supply. And last but not least, the engine, left and right engine sec lights. This basically indicates that the engines are in the backup hydromechanical control mode. And what this means, we're going to see here. So engine sec mode. 
this can occur into, uh, either manual or an automatic. Uh, manual is via the switches, as I mentioned, and automatic is if the AFGC fails for some reason. Battle damage would be a reason. And then the um, uh, <coughs> engine control is automatically handed off to the um, backup mode, regardless of the switch position uh, indicated by the sec lights. And the consequences are we have no afterburner in sec mode. No matter how far you push the throttle forwards, no afterburner. The nozzles are fully closed, regardless of whether you're on the deck or in flight. Uh, this is not that important, but um, if your nozzles close while you close while you are sitting on the deck, this is a good indication that your engines are in sec mode. We use power. That hydromechanical control is not as efficient as the electrical control, and also there's a few, let's say improvements that stabilize the engine they, they do not work in, in sec mode so uh, all in all you have reduced power i'm not sure if this was modeled in, in, in dcs but in real life you would have reduced power this is for you also if your engines are in sec and you want to land on the boat you first have to go uh, have to assess your bolter performance which means you climb to 5,000 feet to drop all the stuff and see how much altitude you lose when trying to do a go around Reduced stall mar margin. Um, stalls can happen um, if um, supersonic air enters the engine, but also if highly disturbed air enters the engine, such as during very high AOA. The, the, the F-14A guys uh, know that. And um, basically, the F-110s, they never stall as long as they're in prime mode. If they're in sec mode, uh, again, some things that improve the stall margin uh, are not working, so we have a reduced stall margin. All right, this is for the engines. Um, uh, next, I would do the environmental control system, unless there are some uh, questions. Okay, let's take a look at the ECS. The ECS, again, it provides the compressed, cooled air to supply our uh, cabin with pressurized air. So the cabin is pressurized. We, we even, I mean, we, we wear the oxygen masks all the time, but technically we don't need them because the cabin is pressurized and um, conditioned. Uh, there's also temperature regulation. Our equipment, we have a lot of electronic equipment like the radar and tech and avionics, INS, whatnot, and this produces a lot of heat, which has to be uh, dissipated by cooling air. Also, if uh, the canopy has the so-called canopy seal, which is also uh, needs compressed air, and then we have the wing bags and external tanks. Uh, for the tanks, uh, the external tanks, they, they are basically at the bottom of the aircraft, and the, the, the fuel has to be pumped upwards to the, to the feed tanks. And the external tanks, they don't have any fuel pump, but they're basically um, pressurized air is getting rooted into the tank and creates an overpressure in that tank and this drives the fuel upwards. So this is basically the things that we that the ECS is needed for. Now how does it work? Um, we have a left and right engine and what we do is we have a high pressure compressor which already compresses air and there, there's just a tiny let's say hole in the in the housing of the engine and through that hole a part of the compressed air is being rooted away from the engine and into the so uh, into a series of heat exchangers now why we do we need that as you may remember when we compress air it gets heated up it's just uh, a law of physics and therefore the the air that we draw out of the compressor may be as hot as 200 degrees which makes it unusable for any cooling purposes so there's a series of heat exchangers that uh, is basically a primary heat exchanger where just free stream air pre-cools it then it enters a certain turbine compressor assembly which cools it even further and then we have a secondary heat exchanger and all of this cools our hot compressor air down to about 20 degrees of celsius and from there it's distributed to the cabin, to the avionics bay, to the AUG-9. The AUG-9 has a, and the Phoenix, they have separate liquid cooled systems. They have their own cooling loops, but um, the heat uh, from the coolant is being dissipated by cool air from the ECS. So basically we need ECS there to, to, to cool our very hot and powerful radar. And of course the gun, there's the gun gas bridging system, which is very important. It basically blows uh, residual uh, uh, gunpowder and gases out of the aircraft. This is important because if we do not have ECS, the gun's not going to work. All right, 
there's one more thing to mention and um, the series of heat exchangers basically the bulk of the air is cooled down to just 20 degrees but a part of the air is taken out earlier of the system so we're getting a bit of hotter air which is about 100 degrees hot and we need it for example for the temperature control so that temperature here is fixed but if you want to say say this is 20 degrees and we want to have 25 degrees in the cabin how do we do that we mix it with hot air which we also get from the heat exchangers and also down here uh, the wing bags they, they can they don't need uh, cooled air they can have the hot one the windshield air you want hot air for that because it's an anti-icing feature and also the tanks are getting hot air which uh, kind of um, also heats up the uh, the fuel a little bit and then we have a series of, of valves that control that so basically each engine has a bleed valve which closes the respective um, duct that, that routes that that air away from that hole in the compressor casing uh, someone is hot miking i think still hot miking yeah yeah get it. really yes oh wait uh oh shit. Ah, thank you. No. And and these these valves basically allow us to control the system in case of failures. And also we have a ram air scoop. This is basically a little, bit, a little pipe that extends out of the aircraft, which serves as an, as an emergency source. We're going to talk about that in a minute. So let's just see. Uh, look at the controls. Basically, the only important thing is the air source selector on the right uh, uh, horizontal panel. And we have a total of five settings. If we have both engines, basically the normal setting, bleed air is taken from both engines, fed to the heat exchangers and distributed. We can also um, take one engine out, say we put the right engine that's closest to bleed valve for the left engine, and everything's running from the right one. And why would you want to do that? For example, if the left engine is out or has been on fire or something else, you want to take it out of any any supplies you hit the right engine button same for the left engine uh, here the right engine is close uh, you would want to do that when refueling because uh, there's a chance that uh, fuel uh, spills out of the hose and enters the right engine and then enters the compressor and then enters the ecs uh, through that uh, through that ducting system and then you're gonna have the smell of fuel in, in the cockpit which is not nice so this is the, basically the normal modes. Uh, one engine generally supplies enough to keep everything cool. But if for some reason we have a, a failure, there's a backup mode. So let's say we have to turn our ECS off completely. This shuts off both engine bleed valves and also shuts off this duct to the heat exchanger. So there is no um, air being fed to the heat exchangers. But we have our emergency ram air scoop, which can be deployed using this switch here put it in decrease uh, increase for about uh, I think 40 seconds and this will deploy the door and this rammer scoop will now provide ram air to our avionics bay and our own nine but we will not have any cabin pressurization we will not have have uh, will not have any hot air for the wing bags windshields and tanks and the gun also won't work but our avionics will hopefully stay cool then we have kind of a middle ground between these two modes which is ram in this case um, the bleed air valves of the engines are kept open but um, the heat exchangers they are not um, they're, they're partially closed so basically air only goes to the primary heat exchanger which um, provides us only with the hot air the cool air portion for the heat exchangers is, is taken out of the equation. So we have a mix of, of ram air from a ram air scoop and from hot air. And with that, we get, we're, we're keeping our ability to de-ice our windshield, to uh, use our wing bags to seal the wings, uh, that gap which, uh, which you get when you um, sweep the wings forward. And we also have a limited amount of cabin pressurization available. Now, uh, uh, we still lose the gun, but still this is a degraded mode, right? So you're going to have to uh, be careful, uh, watch for uh, warnings and failures that might occur, which we're going to talk about now. 
these are the uh, warning lights associated with the ECS. This is in the Rio cockpit and it's basically two lights, missile condition and Org 9 condition. And these mean that for missile condition, the Phoenix coolant, as I mentioned, is a liquid cooled system. It has a coolant loop and that coolant is cooled by the ECS air. And for some reason, we don't get that air or maybe there's a failure in the cooling loop, whatever. A temperature switch will sense that and say, well, the Phoenix coolant is too hot, which means we have to put the liquid cooling switch into Org 9, basically shut down the, the Phoenix cooling system. And the real aircraft, you will also pull a few circuit breakers, which I don't think are modeled in DCS, so um, I left that out. This one says uh, the Org 9 coolant is too hot. Uh, in this case, we put the liquid cooling switch to off and also the WCS to off. There is no need or we shouldn't run the Org 9 with a coolant warning because it may overheat and damage. And the last one is on the right and it's in the pilot's uh, pit, the bleed duct, with bleed duct overheat. Now, going back a little bit, this duct here, ducts here, they are monitored. There are little temp temperature sensors all around um, and they trip at about, I think, 500 Fahrenheit or something or even, no, sorry, 400, which basically means that there is a leak in one of these ducts. And if one of these ducts is leaking, what you want to do is you want to put the air source in off because um, you don't want a uh, hot bleed air circulating inside your fuselage. Put the ram air switch into increase for about 40 seconds and also make sure to fly below an indicated airspeed of 300 knots because that little ram air door, it, it doesn't like high speed. It would break off and you would have problems. So basically, this is this is it uh, for the environmental control system. And let's move on with the fuel system. Unless there's questions. Great. I have one question to the engines. Uh, the TF-30s have, uh, I have, I think, three or four, st five stage afterburner. So do the F-110 have uh, stages or is it uh, gradually increasing, decreasing? The F1 has no stages, it just it gradually <clears throat> gradually increases and decreases. Yes, and how is this called? Uh, this system when it's moving gradually. Uh, I don't know, a gradually adjustable convergent divergent nozzle. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I, did you hear I, the tau? <laughs> did you hear the tau? <laughs> because we had this discussion in the last slide. I'm not sure if there's a really a technical term for a staged convergent divergent nozzle or a continually moving one. It may be there, but I never heard it. I, I really don't know. Okay, thank you very much. For, for example, MiG-21 also has a staged condi because it has two afterburn stages and the yes. moves and the, the, the uh, tier 3 is a 5, but uh, to my knowledge... Jäger, you are still breathing in the mic. Oh man, it can't be. So, so actually, what was your... So, the gauge, it's, it's not, say it's, it's percent, right? And anything from yes. zero to a hundred percent is, is possible. I hope we get uh, these instruments someday in the B. Thank you very much. Okay, let's look at the fuel system, something that uh, caused some confusion in the last patch. Now let's take, again, a schematic um, depiction. We have a left and right feed tank, which hold 1,500 and 1,600 pounds, respectively. And from there, fuel is being fed to the left and right engine. Um, I didn't uh, put it in here, but there's the fuel boost pump that I was talking about. It, it basically sucks fuel from the feed tank and then pushes it to the afterburner fuel control pump and to the combustion chamber fuel control pump. So basically, the engines are only connected to the feed tanks. But the feed tanks themselves are connected to the forward fuselage tank and the after fuselage tank and only to the respective side. So basically we have the aft left system. So the left feed tank is being fed by the aft tank and the right by the forward tank. And we also have our uh, wing and external tanks, which also feed into their respective system. And keep in mind that the wing tanks are, are emptied first. So while there is fuel in either wing or external tank, this is not touched unless we are in full afterburner with uh, with very high engine demand then fuel is flowing from all the tanks we have uh, same for the right system and also um, uh, interesting to know the external tanks and the wing tanks they feed through a common line which means they, f they feed simultaneously 
So this just means uh, all of this totals to 20,000 pounds, roughly. And now if you see on your totalizer something like 16,000 pounds, which would be like 20,000 minus what these two hold, this does not mean that the external tanks are empty. In fact, they will not be empty because part of these 4,000 pounds that are gone come from the left and right wing tanks. So if, if you want to drop your bags for whatever reason, but do not want to lose fuel, make sure to actually check that the external tanks are actually empty. So again, this is the normal situation, fluid is feeding from the feed tanks and whatever is lost from the right or left feed tank to the engine gets replenished by uh, first the wing tanks, external tanks, and then when these are empty, the uh, fuselage tanks uh, step in. Now also you have a bit of a contingency system. So basically we can connect the roof feed groups. We can also connect the left and right wing line. And we can also uh, open a cross feed valve. This is what I was talking about doing uh, the, for the few few low lights, a uh, few pressure low lights. So this means that one of the fuel pumps is um, has failed, but this automatically opens the cross feed valve, and which means that the working uh, fuel pump will take over for both engines. But under certain circumstances, this might not be enough to um, provide af uh, full afterburner fuel. Now let's look at the systems and uh, controls and warning panels. I was of the bingo light, which is bingo fuel. Left and right fuel load, uh, feed, uh, fuel load feed tank is below 1,000 pounds. This is particularly important because um, when this comes on, um, you're risking losing an engine. If you fly an afterburner for very long, these might come on, but generally you cannot starve an engine by uh, by running afterburner for too long. But uh, uh, if, if you're not an afterburner and we're just flying uh, on cruise power and these come on and you have more than a, a total of 2,000 pounds, it might be worth checking um, your settings. So this is the feed control switch. It, uh, we're going to talk about it later, what it does. Here's the fuel display selector, which I'll also <laughs> come to in a second. Um, this is a refueling probe. Putting it into fuselage will only refuel the fuselage tanks, putting them to all refuel everything while well, while do we have this option first of all maybe you don't want to take a fuel uh, full fuel load then you can limit it to this or maybe you have holes in your wings for battle damage very much possible but you need to refuel but in this case you probably want to use the fuselage only next is the wing external transition switch and basically it controls the transition from wing fuel to the feed tanks a uh, wing and external fuel to the wing tanks and it can be either an off which forces the transition to off in auto which uh, means transition is off as long as the landing gear is down and when the landing gear is up and there is fuel left in either the wing or the external tanks transition will be uh, activated and an override to force the transition on and the override is something you would use when um, you fly and you see, the, for example, you have 15,000 pounds left and the wing tanks are full for whatever reason. Maybe uh, some of the valves have failed in the auto mode. You could put it in override and try to force force that fuel into your uh, feed tanks. Less dump switch, we don't know what this is good for, um, dumping fuel or making uh, cool rocket launches, everything's possible. So. Let's take a look at uh, the indications that we have. This is our fuel indicator on the uh, right knee panel. We have these two tapes and these two tapes, they will always show the total between fuselage and respective feed tank. So this is basically the total of that. Same thing for the aft left group, feed tank plus fuselage. No wing tanks, no external tanks, just these two. Then we have uh, this window, which is controlled by the switch I was talking about earlier. And depending on the setting, it, it defaults to feed. And in feed, it's going to show us the quantity in the feed tank, left or right. In external, it's going to show us the quantity in the external tank. And in wing, it's going to show us uh, the quantity in the wing tank. Nothing too special. Now let's see what happens if we put our, oh, by the way, just, um, just to show it again, left and right systems are normally completely isolated. So basically there is no connection during normal operation between these two systems. When the switch is in norm. But we can put 
put it out of norm in, for example, forward feet. And what happens is, first, the uh, left and right wing feet lines are connected. Basically, that shouldn't matter, since by the time you would use the feet switch, the wing and external tanks would be empty anyway. However, if for some reason, let's say, uh, fuel from the right uh, wing tank could, does not transfer into feed tank, whatever you do, you, you you put the transfer switch in override, it's, it's not working. And what, what you can do is if you switch the few feet switch to forward or aft, doesn't matter, you can route right wing fuel into the left tank. Theoretically impossible. Next is the Subtech interconnect valve opens, connecting both think, uh, feed tanks. And in that situation, uh, the transfer from the after tank is completely shut off. And fuel froze from from either the uh, external tanks, the wing tanks, or the forward fuselage into the right feed tank, and from there part of it flows into the left feed tank. So basically, both engines run on the forward right system. After feed, same situation, but this time the forward fuselage tank is getting excluded from our feed. Again, the wing lines are connected and the sump tank, sum tank interconnect valve operates in the opposite direction. Um, yeah, this is basically all there is. And the bug that we had, I think, um, was that um, for some reason the, the, the airplane was initialized in, let me, I guess, aft left in the, yeah, in the aft left in this configuration. So when you started flying, it would, it would ignore the forward fuselage tank and would drain everything from here. And if you flip the switch, it, it kind of removed the bucket, put it back into the normal operation mode. Uh, this is a bit of a more naturalistic depiction. Um, here we have the so-called box beam tanks. And below that is a sump tank. And both of these make up the uh, feed tank with the 1,500 something pounds. And here we have the forward fuselage tank, just, just behind the, the rear cockpit. And we have the aft fuselage group and the aft fuselage and the two wing tanks. And of course the external tank. So next, any questions for the fuel system? Brilliant. Let's take a look at the hydraulic system. Just first question. Yeah. If possible. But as so uh, to see an anomaly in the feeding system, you just have to continuously monitor uh, the meters. Well, you don't have to because both groups hold roughly the same amount of fuel and both engines consume roughly the same amount of fuel. So, uh, let me get the bullets. So, basically, when this is the case, the, the fuel in both groups will be depleted at the same rate. And there's also one more thing. Once uh, once the fuel drops in either of these tanks below 1000, these tanks are connected. So if at that point, there's still a bit of imbalance between the two systems, it's going to even out. So normally, you don't have to touch the switch at all, down to zero pounds of fuel, because it's again very well automated. Um, again. Uh, equal amounts of fuel in both groups, equal engine demand, roughly, which means both groups are going to run out the fuel at roughly the same time. And if they don't, you still have um, uh, the interconnect. Uh, let's say this. Uh, let's say, let's say everything is empty. Everything is empty, and you have I don't know 1,200 pounds here and 900 pounds left here. This valve will open automatically and even out um, the, the fuel level so so both engines keep running until until you let until you're out of fuel that answer the question yeah pretty much thank you <laughs> okay let's take a look at the hydraulic system now why do we need that um, we have large control surfaces and we have a large aircraft which means uh, the pilot's muscle cannot provide the forces required to operate these these control surfaces so uh, we have to we, have, we need to have some sort of powered control, and this is realized by the the actuators on, say, the stabilizers. This is basically just just a piston that is within a housing, and with two valves. And depending on where pressure is, uh, 
where the, in which direction the pressure difference goes, the piston will move forward and aft, and uh, driver driver control surface. It's a little bit more difficult than that, but basically that's how it works. And why do we use hydraulic systems? Uh, like in many applications, a hydraulic system has the advantage that you only need one local source of power, which is your hydraulic pump. I mean, you can transfer that power to any any place within your aircraft without losing any power of it, because uh, the hydraulic fluid, uh, it's not flowing too much. I mean, there's a little bit fluid going back and forth, but you don't have any friction loss by some insane flow rates. And also the, the, the routing itself is, is almost trivial. It's just pipes. Uh, you can also, for example, do it with electric motors, but then you need an electric motor for each control surface. I know too complicated. So let's see how this is realized on the Tomcat. Again, we have our engines providing power to our combined systems pump and our flight hydraulic system pump. And both of these pumps power the left at uh, the left step, the left rudder, the right step and the right rudder. This is basically all we need to control the aircraft. I mean, we still have flaps and spoilers and stuff, but this is this makes flying easier, but we don't need it technically. We can do everything with, with these four. And this is why both hydraulic systems power them. Note that although both hydraulic systems power, for example, the left rudder, they are still hydraulically independent. There is no physical connection between these two lines, not even within the, the actuator that, that, drives the, that drives the control surface, which means these systems are completely isolated. So this is for the um, for primary flight control surfaces, but there's a little bit more than that. And that is taken by the combined system. So for example, the left and right main and aux flaps are both powered by the combined system. Then we have our left and right inboard spoilers. Remember, we have two spoiler pairs, one inboard, one outboard. The inboard ones are powered by the combined system. Now, what about the outboard spoilers? They have their own so-called outboard spoiler module. The outboard spoiler module is an electrically driven hydraulic pump, which provides the power to actuate the outboard spoilers. Now, why do we, why did the engineers decide to do that? Basically, you want to concentrate your hydraulic lines as much as possible within the aircraft. You don't, you don't want them to protrude into the wings. And in fact, um, the, the, the drives for the flaps, it's inside the fuselage. So basically, um, the thing that, that drives the flaps is the shaft, which protrudes into the wing. But the, the line itself does not protrude into the wing for the aux flaps and main flaps to work. But for the spoilers, you have to route the hydraulic line through the wing. And you want to have that line to be as short as possible because a wing is likely to get damaged in battle, which would rupture the line and basically make the system bleed out. So you want to reduce your hydraulic routing as much as possible within within your wing. So for the output spoilers, the engineers decided to make a separate module. It also has a, a secondary um, role, which I'm going to talk about in a second. But first, let's see what, what else is powered by hydraulic pumps. This is left and right ramp. As uh, I saw you, there's these these actuators that, that position the ramps and they are hydraulically powered by their respective sides. So the left ramp uses combined uh, system power, the right ramp uses flight hydraulic system power. And then both systems also provide power for the wing sweep system. Again, they are hydraulically separated. There is no connection within the wing sweep drive, making these two systems fully independent. So if for example, the combined uh, system gets ruptured and we lose fluent, the flight uh, hydraulic system remain, uh, retains its integrity because they're separated. And lastly, there's a few utility functions that the combined system performs, which is, for example, the speed brake, the gear uh, up down, hook up down, the gun drive, you have a Gatling gun and it needs to turn and the hydraulic power is used for that, the air to air refueling probe and our normal brakes and last but not, also sorry that comes later now a bit for the uh, emergency and redundancy provisions now down here you have a so-called bi-di or bi-directional pump bi-directional pump is connected to both systems but it is connected mechanically which means 
uh, there is a rotor which is placed somewhere in, in the combined system and there is the same rotor uh, placed or uh, uh, not the same but uh, uh, technologically <laughs> same rotor placed uh, somewhere within the flight hydraulic system rotating and they are both connected via a shaft so let's say the flight hydraulic pump fails for whatever reason what happens uh, essential senses that opens a valve that starts turning the, the rotor that is combined, uh, connected to the combined system. This rotor turns the shaft that in turn turns the rotor which is uh, within the flight system and provides um, uh, hydraulic power to this. So basically we convert hydraulic power to mechanical power and then mechanical power back to hydraulic power to, to run the, 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 the failed system. This enables us basically to either pump and power either system without having a hydraulic connection between them. Again, very important if there's battle damage or rupture. Uh, and in fact, the first Tomcat crash ever was, uh, was a flight test aircraft where uh, one of the uh, hydraulic lines ruptured. And I think back then they didn't have the same level of redundancy, so the aircraft crashed. But the, the crew bailed out in time, unfortunately. So this is our, our basically our first level of redundancy. We can we can substitute any of these pumps with a working pump, but uh, sometimes both pumps fail, and then we have the so-called backup flight control module. The backup flight control module is again a, an electrically driven hydraulic motor that provides pressure to that part of the combined system that that drives the steps and the rudders. So if for whatever reason we have a dual hydraulic pump failure, we can still control our primary flight control surfaces by using uh, hydraulic pressure from the backup flight control model, provided the uh, structural integrity of the combined system is preserved and there's still fluid in it. And lastly, the outboard spoiler, mod <coughs> outboard spoiler model which I was talking about, it has a secondary function. It can also drive our left and right main flaps if the primary drive has failed. This occurs automatically. There is no cockpit control for that. This is not emergency down or something. Whenever um, the combined system is lost, this will automatically take over the uh, function of raising and lowering the flaps. And also we have the hand pump that some of you may have seen. It's on the left side of the seat. And we can use that to either extend our air-to-air -air refueling door uh, probe or to pump the brakes. Um, a little bit on that, uh, we have uh, in the Tomcat, we have a so-called parking brake accumulator. This is basically a little pressure accumulator, which uh, in case of a, of a total hydraulic failure, provides us with maybe four or five full brake applications. So basically, if, if we land the aircraft, we can still stop it, provided that uh, that accumulator is charged. And if for some reason it is not charged, you can use the hand pump to charge it. Um, this is a little gauge um, below the HSD, at the very bottom of the cockpit, which you may have seen uh, right next to the um, cabin pressure, uh, cabin altitude indicator. Um, there's actually two uh, needles. One is for the parking brake accumulator, which we can charge. And there's also an aux brake accumulator, which is a, a nitrogen bottle. We cannot charge this, we just have it. And uh, in case there is a brake failure, it's gonna automatically take over. Um, I also marked this in purple, uh, just to denote there is, a, should we lose combined hydraulic system power, uh, we, can, uh, we have emergency provisions to extend these two and make safe recovery. And at the very last, uh, the combined hydraulic system also powers the emergency generators. Should we lose our primary source of electrical power, we have a little emergency generator that is being powered by hydraulic fluid. Because this is all mechanical, right? Even if, if we lose all electrical power, the pumps keep running, they keep supplying um, pressure to the flight controls. So actually we don't need hydro electrical power to fly the aircraft, this is, this is all mechanical. These servers, they're controlled by, by rods and, and cables that are attached directly to the flight stick. Um, but uh, we can we still have uh, that emergency generator which uses combined system power. Let's take a look at the controls and indicators. So at the right, we have our hydraulic system indicators. 
here we have uh, it just tells us the pressure the discharge pressure of the combined pump and the flight pump uh, this is supposed to say comp i don't know why heatler hasn't fixed it yet but so be it um it should about it should be about 3000 psi which is indicated by that band next one we have is this little window here and it tells us if our outboard spoiler module is on or not now why would we have to want it off uh, this is an electric motor and if we're sitting on the ramp with our engines running and um, there's not enough cooling air you know to, to cool these electric motors so if if it would run on the ground for I don't know, 10 20 minutes it would probably fail so on the ground the output spoiler module is off unless the flaps are down if the flaps are down this means we were about to take off and this basically activates the output spoiler model and in flight it's always on and you can check its status with that little window here this is uh, the state of our backup flight control module it has uh, two modes of operation high and low and um, the low mode will automatically kick in if both flight and combined pressure drops below 2100 psi this will activate the low mode. There is no restriction on how long you can act, operate in low mode. But there is also a high mode. And uh, the low mode delivers only 300 PSI, basically a tenth of what, uh, what we usually get. This makes, uh, control, this makes control surface rates very low and flying very sluggish. It's okay for flying straight, but if we, for example, want to do air-to-air -air refueling, which you can still do because we can we can hand pump the AR door, um, and we need control authority. We can put it in high mode, but the restriction for that is 20 minutes. If we if we operate in high mode for longer than 20 minutes, we risk a, a failure of the backup flight control module. So let's take a look at the controls down here. It's basically just two guard switches. As I said, this is the control for the emergency flight hydraulic or BFCM. Usually it's in the auto mode, which means it kicks in automatically, as mentioned, whether we can manually turn it on to low mode or manually to high mode. And then we have our bi-die control. This is basically either shut off or normal. Um, and normal, it's gonna take over automatically as soon as I think there's uh, above 2,900 or something on one side and below 2,000, I think below 2,000, 800 on the other side and but we can also manually shut it off um, for example if if we know that there's like um, if, if we know there's a, a hole in, in the line or somewhere and we know okay it's, there's no point in, in pumping power in here because it's not going to work anyway we can shut it off and also for testing purposes all right yeah, one more thing I want to mention, what do we do if we have a total combined system failure? So, which means the pump has failed or um, we have uh, uh, the lines are ruptured, we have no flow. Basically, what do we do if we have no pressure in the combined system and what systems are not working? First of all, we will have not have the normal gear extent, but we can use the emergency gear extent, which uh, uses um, pressurized air in a bottle uh, in the forward wheel well and what we do is um, we push in the gear handle twist by 90 degrees and then pull it out and the pull is going to take a lot of force 20 pounds or something and this will manually open the valves of that uh, of that uh, bottle and uh, provide pressure to the to the cylinders and basically blow the gear down it's in dcs it's right click on the gear handle um, Yeah, it's, yeah, exactly. Uh, you can't retract it, it's one time use, and also if you do it, you're not gonna have no, no nose through steering. Uh, you also have no normal hook extent, but you can still use emergency down, which releases the uplock mechanism and the hook will drop, but you can't raise it anymore. This is also a one way um, thing. You're not gonna have inboard spoilers, DLC or AUX slabs. Your main slabs will work, but uh, no inboard spoilers slash DLC. You're also not gonna have speed brakes. And the AAR, air, air refueling probe will not work, but you can use the hand for that. And the gun won't work because uh, the gun the gun drive uses combined systems power. Oh, sorry. And also one more thing, no normal brakes. Uh, you can just 
check the brake pressure accumulator and if, if the brake pressure is low you can hand pump it a bit but in any way you're not gonna have anti-skid so if you're landing on, on the beach and have a short runway keep in mind you will have no inboard spoilers no speed brakes and no anti-skid and also no aux flaps which will greatly increase your your ground roll all right and yeah No, I, what, well, in real life, you can't partially extend it. I, I'm not sure where this is coming from in DCS, but it, it uses hydraulic power. And if it's not there, it, it's not going to extend because the, 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 the air is going to blow it closed. Right? It, it has to work against the resistance. Um, <laughs> but it's just the list of things to fix is so long. <laughs> I don't want to add anything more to it. But yeah, in real life, I mean, what, what what could be is that there's some kind of residual pressure in that part of the line which is connected to to the speed brake, right? Maybe there's some 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 valves or something which which trap a bit of pressure, and as you you said, click the switch, that that pressure is released and it's just enough to partially extend it, but then that's it. It may be realistic, I don't know, but but for all intents and purposes, uh, you're not gonna be able to use it. Yeah. It, you know, it's it's only uh, connected to the combined uh, hydraulic line. Mm, yeah, exactly. If you uh, if if you lose the fluid from the combined system, it's it's not gonna work. Yeah. 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 I also, uh, it's almost, yeah, I, I don't know. You mean in TCS or in real life? Yeah, that's right. But uh, I mean, I think it's well, basically this one provides power to the essentials, and I think it's a good thing to to, to not let both systems, you know, protrude into the wings or into the gear well and stuff. No, no, no. It it doesn't. It doesn't. Uh, it, 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 just, just, it, it, it really gives you the, the minimum that you need to somehow fly the aircraft. Keep in mind that a double hydraulic failure is practically impossible. Um, and if, if you get enough damage to, to knock out both pumps, you're not going to make it home anyway, probably. This is basically more of a contingency if, if let's say, one pump fails, which, which happens in real life, it, maybe in DCS. Um, and then maybe both pumps fail, which is already super improbable. But from a, from a battle damage control point of view, I mean, this is what, what the flight system does. The combined system is likely to be hit because it has lines everywhere, but the flight system does not. Basically, all of this is concentrated at the back of the aircraft, where the rudders are and the steps. And of course, to the AICS, but you have to, but this is all fuselage. Nothing, nothing protrudes into the wings. So the, 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 it's far more likely that yeah, the, the combined system gets hit. Yeah. Oh, the, yeah. Ex ex exactly. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you also kind of somewhat reduced control authority but I, i'm not i'm not sure if if, if it's this modeled but if you only have one pump working you might not have enough power for both but i'm not sure about that but yeah you're right you you shouldn't be going too fast if if you lose pressure on, on either of these okay so now for the last part it's kind of the electric system it's it's going to be quick again the engines are primary power source and this time they drive our left and right generators. The generators provide 115 volt 400 hertz AC power 
and they power their respective left and right AC buses. And these buses, they basically distribute that power to all kinds of system, radar, communication, lights, whatever. There's also a bus tie system, which kind of connects these two systems should one of the generators fail. So let's say the left generator fails, uh, the bus tie closes and the right generator will power both buses. Uh, also, we have the external power, which we have a battery on the Tomcat, so uh, to start it up, we need external power, and it's just fed into the AC system, powering everything, basically. Although I'm not quite sure if it only powers the left AC bus. I would have to research that. But never mind, uh, we also have a DC system, and we have the left and right transformer rectifiers, which convert our 115 volt 400 hertz ac power into 28 volt dc power a lot of instruments need both ac and dc power some need only dc power something like lights right lights dc power and uh, basically our transform rectifiers provide for that and there is also the dc bus tie again should any of these fail the other one will take over and then we also have the so-called essential buses essential bus one and two um, now, why do why do we have these? If um, for for these buses, we have a separate emergency power source, which is the emergency generator that I talked about earlier, and basically the the, the very most essential um, systems are connected to these buses. So if we have double generator failure, we lose everything, but our emergency generator provides just you know enough um, power to to provide um, electrical power to vital systems uh, but i'm gonna just uh, i'm gonna mention which these are but let's first let's have a look at the indicators and controls there's basically only three lights we have the left and right uh, generator lights which just tell us whether the generator is operating or not if the light is on the generator is off Losing either generator doesn't have any consequences other than losing redundancy because either generator can take over the whole load of the uh, can take the, the, the load of the whole system. And you have the transformer rectifier light, which signals failure of any of the transformer rectifiers. Uh, it doesn't show us which one, but this is also to let us know. Um, what can happen is, let's say the left generator light comes on together with the transformer rectifier light. Now this this could mean that the AC bus tie failed because if only one of the generators fails, let's say the left one, the right takes over the whole load and we still have power on both transformer rectifiers. So this light wouldn't come on. But if this one light comes on with, with one of the generator lights, this is a strong indication that the bus tie has failed and that we're gonna lose uh, a lot of essential and also mission essential equipment like radar and whatnot. Let's take a look at the controls. Uh, the, the engine, uh, the electrical control panel is pretty small. Uh, we have the switches for the generators. They're usually they just left and norm, which means the generators come online as soon as I think 45 or 50 percent RPM. But we can also put them in off. Well, why would we want to do that? Imagine we have an electrical fire with fumes in the cockpit. We don't know where this is coming from. The so best thing is just put the gen uh, remove all electrical power from the aircraft. Again, the aircraft can't fly without electrical power, uh, but um, we might want to. Uh, but it cannot fly if it's burning. So. If uh, the electrical fire procedures actually to turn both generators off and then we can control the emergency generator again we can turn it off in case of an electrical fire or we can leave it in norm which means it will kick in whenever both transformer rectifiers fail which is uh, which basically means that both generators have failed okay um yeah and now for the last part yeah Yeah, um, the, the isolate switch, what it does is um, it isolates the combined system from the from the gear. Um, I have, not, and that's it, yeah. Um, I, I'm not sure what the practical use is uh, because there's no normal procedure that prescribes the, the isolate switch to, to be put in the on position. Um, 
what you but there is an emergency procedures and i think uh, if you're losing pressure on the combined side one thing you do is put the isolate switch into isolate because there may be um, a leak in the gear system and you would uh, basically uh, stop the fluid from leaking out of the of some damaged gear piston or something this is what you have it for yeah maybe it could be also could be also for maintenance we had something like that on a tornado as well so when you have it on like a stance up um you can isolate the gear so it doesn't come down when you have uh, hydraulic power on the aircraft yeah fairness um yeah and uh, you can see that the gear lever has has a bit of, of metal thing that kind of pushes the switch down if you pull the lever down because you, well you can't uh, is, if a pilot for whatever reason has put it into isolate and then wants to um put it down so it doesn't accidentally uh, forget uh, the gear actually there was some real life cases where for whatever reason that that metal thing was bent up so it wouldn't um, automatically keep the isolation switch in, in, in not isolated and then when taking off at night a pilot accidentally flipped the isolation switch up and then tried to raise the gear which did not work and there he was saying that he had a gear failure which was basically that switch being in the wrong position uh, maintenance crew loved him for that okay if we have a combined systems failure um, oh sorry that is ah here we are do generate a failure unlikely but can happen uh, we still have the emergency generator and will power a number of um, essential systems one of these are the flight instruments we will keep our airspeed indicator our vti our altimeter all basically everything you need to fly also include the um, fuel emitters and the engine instrument group uh, of course the fire detection protection system remains operational if there's a fire it will be detected and can be dealt with the communication systems also also remains functional so we can talk to other aircraft or ground stations our iff transmitter remains functional so our friendlies can identify us and not shoot us down the engine ignition remains operational. This is important if we have an engine flame out for some reason, we can reignite that engine. The instrument lights, also important if you're flying at night, you don't need to put out your flashlight. If you lose both generators, the lights will be there. The stability augmentation system also remains operational, just as the flaps, nose, wheel, steering, speed brake, and inboard spoilers. Now, why do we have this point? I said that the hydraulic system works independent of electrical power. This is true, but things like speed brakes, this is an electric switch on your throttle. Just like um, the flaps, you have a lever which also controls, which is electrically wired to the uh, to the respective control source. For, for this to work, you need both electrical power and hydraulic power. And our essential buses make sure that uh, these things still work, provided there is hydraulic pressure. And the AUG-15, which is our uh, weapon control system, which means you can still jettison things and you can even fire the sidewinder, provided you get a tone. And of course, you cannot fire uh, Phoenix or Sparrows because the radar won't work. All right, guys, that's it. Uh, good question. I, I think yes, because uh, when I looked at the diagram, I saw the, 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 the hut. Um, um, Part of the hot electrical supply being listed as one of the essentials. I'm not sure on that. Um, I can try it in DCS. But what, but what definitely remains on us is the AHRS. So your heading reference will still work. Not, not, not I, I. Well, the cross is in your mind, right? You can. <laughs> it is, yeah. Although, again, I'm not sure on that, but it, it should be because if, if the AUG 15 remains functional, there's no reason why you would not be able to fire a sidewinder. But this is this is something I would have to check. But what you would definitely can do is jettison things, which is basically probably more important than um, shooting stuff down. <laughs> uh, all right guys that's it and uh, thank you for your attention and if there's any questions or suggestions feedback uh, please uh, let me know